not high maintenance. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> I better get started. It's time to go and get started, not to leave. Please stay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Time for another wonderful morning of chemistry, Chem 1211, with your host, me, Dr. White. Have you noticed when I do this, my eyes pop open? But anyways, it's going to be a fun-filled morning, and I got a special surprise for you later in a little while. All right. Since all of you, I hope, have uploaded your tests, or will do by 1 o'clock, uh, it wouldn't have been fair to say, oh, you should be doing problem set chapter 9. Next Thursday, I'll go through chapter 9 problem set. But I can still do a few examples for you again, which will help you, which is always a good thing. After that, I'll have my special surprise for you. And then we'll do a wonderful lab I wrote. Shy, aren't I? Or not shy, that's not the right. Modest, aren't I? <laughs> and we'll go through that and I'll show you how to do it on Beyond Lab Z. So let's get started. Everybody see my whiteboard, white screen? Thank you. All right, one of the things students have troubles with, and that's why I like to do repetition, is electron configuration. And here we're showing all electrons. And when we talk about electron configuration, you have to know about the shells, which are the electron shells, and the subshells, which are the electron subshells. And those are where the electrons are. And a shell is a proximate distance from the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus is the center of an atom where protons and neutrons hang out. That doesn't sound scientific, where neutrons and protons are found. That's better. And they're approximately the same distance and the same energy. Subshells are in the shells, and electrons in the subshells are exactly the same distance and exactly the same energy level as the electrons that are other electrons in that subshell from the nucleus. Now, when we talk about shells, they have very difficult names. And there's shell one, two, three, four. Like I said, very difficult names. Now, the shell name tells you how many number of subshells are in that shell. And shell one, this is real difficult, has one subshell. Shell two has two, three has three, four has four. An important thing about shells is shell one is the lowest energy. As you go down, the energy increases, the energy of the electrons in the shell. And for this table, four is the highest energy. Now, when we talk about subshells, they have letters for names that correspond to names that we don't use anymore, like S is for the subshells. on a whiteboard in class. 
I'm just about as straight with my lines. I see a question. Hold on. Too sorry, far. it's me. Um, I do. This is. I'm sorry. I thought I was me. There's two questions that I have with regard to these tables that you're setting up, and I can't remember if you mentioned this before, but this is this will be on our chapter two test, and it'll also be on the final. Do we memorize these tables, oh, or on, oh, you'll give them to us? Hold on. About a year and a half ago, I was teaching Chem 1105, which I teach this. I was talking to this one faculty member who teaches chemistry, and he brought up something that made me think about how I teach. And what he made me think about was, am I, when I test a student, am I testing their knowledge of chemistry or am I also testing their memory? This is chemistry, not memory 1211. So what I decided to do was certain things, which I used to make students memorize, I now put in important information. For those of you who took Test number one, you saw the temperature conversions. In the past, I made students memorize that. You still have to memorize, but I've cut down way amount of the amount of memorization. Therefore, and to answer your question directly, the two tables, the one I've written and the one I'm about to write, you don't have to memorize anymore. Yay, you can do the little orange you. thing or clap your hands or do nothing. And then the second question that I have is the subshells you were talking about are just an initial S, P, D, and F, but what, is, what does that stand for something? Yep, uh, hang in there, let me do the table, then okay. I'll pull up chapter right. nine, which I gave it to you, but I don't ask you to know, okay? okay? Dr. White's thorough, sometimes. All right, let's finish this table and then I'll get to your students. Excellent question, always all questions are good questions. Now we have the subshells and important, I'll abbreviate. You should know about the subshells, the maximum number of electrons you can put in there. And they are S, P, D, and F, 2, 6, 10, 14. Now let's look at these two tables. Oh, let's be label them table A and table B. One from table A, one from. Anyways, good news. In important information on test number two, these will be given to you. If you don't believe me, which you really should, but if you don't, go to the lecture folder of Blackboard, scroll to the bottom, and I already have posted there, test number two, important information, and you will see these tables. Now, before I leave this table and answer your colleague's question, and who's asking a question, I'll get to it in a second. Let me just finish this. S is the lowest energy level of the subshells. And as you move down the table, F is the highest. And why is this important? Because chemists found that mother nature, who's the greatest of all chemists, always fills the lowest energy shell and subshells with electrons before you go to the next lowest energy. Ah, Anne already found it, and I think it's uh, S stands for S. Uh, S stands for S. <laughs> I like that. S stands for S. P stands for P. D. <laughs> I even cracked myself up. By the way, if I were in class right now and I'd be standing in front of a whiteboard, I'd ask you all, "Am I invisible now? White on white, and the whiteboard behind me." Sort of like a white cow in a snowstorm, Never mind. All right. S is for sharp, P is for principal, D is diffuse, and F is fundamental. Why they picked those, don't ask me, because that's not my area. 
I know where it comes from. Those subshells were discovered from atomic uh, emission spectra, where you heat up an element and you put it, the light from that comes from that element when you heat it up through a prism and you see different lines, which I showed you. And some of those lines, chemists way back in the late 1800s or thereabouts, gave those names and for subshells and it stuck. Why? I'm not sure. <laughs> there are better things I spend my time on searching, even though if you ever have time on a Sunday afternoon, go to Google and find out. Have you noticed a generation gap thing I do? I rarely, almost never use Google as a verb. This is one of the rare times they go Google it. No, Dr. White doesn't do that. I don't. All right, let's get back to shells and subshells. So these two tables, you should know how to use. You do not have to memorize them because I'll give them to you. But what you do have to do is know how to use them. And let's say, I might say draw, or I might say give, depending on my move. And depending when I write the test, it's anywhere from three to five points each. And I will usually give a couple. Oops, I gave it away. And I could put down, draw the electron configuration or give the electron configuration for oxygen. Well, what do you do? Well, first of all, you have to know how many electrons you have, which means I got to open up a periodic table, hang in there. And you should all see the periodic table on your screen. And I see smile. You don't or do? How many see the periodic? Oh no. Zoom, zoom me again. It said screen and it should. All right. Now do you see it? All right. Thank you. All right. Now, first of all, for electron configuration, you have to figure out how many electrons do you have? And if we look here, Oxygen, upper right-hand corner, atomic number, eight electrons, also eight protons, but we're just dealing with the electrons. So now I know that, and this you don't have to do, but I like to. I now know I have eight electrons. Now, if we come up here, what's the first shell? Because you always start, ooh, I'm gonna do something amazing. You always start here, and go down, same thing here. Start lowest each subshell. Well, the first shell is one, and its subshell is 1s. Remember, a subshell is both a number and a letter. How many electrons can we put in any s orbital? And the answer is two. Well, you show that by doing superscript, that means above to the right of the letter. Well, that's two, I got six more. How many subshells are there in one? One, well, I filled it up because I can only put two electrons in a S subshell. Well, what's the next shell? Well, going to the next highest level, it's two. And what's the lowest subshell in two? 2s. How many electrons can I put in there? Two. Well, two plus two is four. I'm not up to eight yet, which I have to get. How many subshells does two have? And the answer is two. And therefore, if we look at this, the next one, s is the lowest, we just filled 2s, we now go to 2p. 
remember a subshell designation is both a number and a letter. How many electrons can I put max into P? And the answer is six, but I have eight minus four, which means I have four left to go, and I can put them all in there, and I'm done. And this is the answer you should have for the electron configuration of oxygen. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. 2 plus 2 plus 4, 8 electrons. Now, everybody see the periodic table? Thank you. Remember, doctor, shh, don't tell anybody. Remember my secret gift, shh, it's secret, that on a test and a final, I'll only ask you to know how to do electron configurations up to magnesium. When you go to these higher ones here, you start having to deal with exceptions. I'd rather you learn other things than exceptions. If you're a chem major, well, matters what branch of chemistry is important. For organic chemists, nah. And therefore, I'm going to let you try and do the electron configuration for sodium. While we have it here, well, I'll give you 8.7 seconds for you to find how many electrons sodium has. Times up, uh, sodium Na, and it has 11. And so you have 11 electrons. Let me lower this so you can see the chart and have fun. Dr. White cheers on this nice snowy morning. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. If you have your video on, give me a nice big smile. I say that in the classroom too, not thumbs up. I tell my students, look up and smile when you're done. Or if you want, you can frown too, but nah, I like smiling better. And for those of you with dogs and cats, they're permitted in my class. For those of you without dogs in class or cats, you can come to. <laughs> oh, it's snowy, bad humor Thursday. How many different ways can I define awful bad humor? We'll find out this semester. Aren't you glad I'm not high? Today I'm going to talk about electrons, electron subshell. Oh, put me to sleep quick. All right, anybody need more time? Going once, twice. Let's do it. All right, we have 11 electrons. What's the first shell? One. What's its first subshell? 1s. How many electrons can we put in any s orbital? Two. So therefore, immediately I can do first shell is one, is subshell is S, and I can put two electrons. Well, I did it. Now, 
How many subshells does one have? One. Well, I filled it up. Now I go to the next lowest energy level, and that's two. And what's the lowest energy level uh, subshell in two? And that's 2s, which I can put in two electrons. So I'm going to do that. Remember, subshell, number, letter. And I now put in two electrons. Well, that's four, and I've got to get to 11. I've got more work to do. Now I come over here and say, I'm in shell two. How many subshells? Oh, look, I have two of them. The first one is S, and I go to next lowest. Oh, it's P. How many electrons maximum can I put in P? Six electrons. And therefore, remember, a subshell number letter. And I can put in six. Let's see, two plus two plus six, that equals 10. I got to get to 11. I still have more work to do. All right, now. How many subshells does shell two have? Two, which are 2s and 2p. I fill them. So I now have to go to the next shell, and that is three. What's the first subshell in three? 3s. Three How many electrons can I put in any s orbital? Two. How many do I have left to go? Well, 11 minus 10 equals one. So there's my one and I'm done. And for sodium, which I, you don't have to write, but just to remind you, chemical symbol Na. We have one S2, two S2, two P6, three S1. And that's how you do electron configuration. Ooh, I just thought of something. I totally zoned out. I should have wished everybody, uh, I don't know if I'm a different religion. Do you say have a happy Lent? I don't know if that's, that doesn't sound right. But anyways, after lab today, those of you who like to stick around for a couple minutes, Dr. White will tell one of his Mardi Gras stories, how I went to Mardi Gras and a company's money. Actually, two or three times I went, which meant I was on a credit card, which had a $30,000 a month limit. It was fun. All right, let's move on to another area you should be familiar with. And that's valence electrons. And again, since you had the test you did yesterday and today and you studied for it, I'm not doing a problem set today, but I am going over some stuff that you should be learning. And what are the valence electrons or valence electron? You should know those are the outermost electrons of an atom. And this you should know. So if your neighbor calls you up on the phone and says, do you know what an valence electron, you should be able to say, oh, yes, I do. They're the outermost electrons of an atom. I doubt that will happen, but you never know. All right. Now, when it comes to valence electrons, how do you determine how many valence electrons an element has? Oops.
All right. So on sometime in the future, you may see on something I send to you or you download 22 points each, how many valence electrons are in sodium, oxygen, and chlorine. Well, how do you do that? Well, you got to go to your periodic table. And this is the one I'll give you also for test number two. And how do you find valence electrons? It's not the number in the box. Those are all electrons. It's the number on top of the column for the family. In this case, everything in this column has one valence electron. In this column two, we go over here, carbon, four valence electrons. This column five is both Roman numeral, which I learned a couple of years ago, not all students know. V is five, VI is six, seven, eight. And every element in that column, that's the number of valence electrons. You never have more than eight valence electrons, never less than one. So let's look at the first one we asked, and it's sodium. If we go back here, sodium and A, it has one valence electron. Now, while we have the periodic table up, I'll let you figure out how many valence electrons oxygen has. Uh, time's up. It's six. And I see a question or somebody helped me out. Somebody's helped me out. Thank you. And the last one I had A, B, and C. How many valence electrons does chlorine have? And the answer is it's a halogen. It's located here. Go to the top, and you have seven valence electrons. Now, once you know about the valence electrons, an important thing to know is how to draw a Lewis structure. And a Lewis structure, you use a chemical symbol and you put a dot on each side before doubling up, but you use a dot for each valence electron. So if I were to ask you three points each, draw the Lewis structure for oxygen. First of all, you have to find how many valence electrons we just did as six valence electrons. And the chemical symbol is O. And you put a dot on each side before doubling up. And organic chemists like to double this one and this one. And if I counted correctly, I did. There are six dots around there. There are four, three other structures. I'll do one other, which organic chemists never do, but I'll do for you. And this would be also totally correct. And it turns out I'll show you later this chapter, next one, how useful Lewis structures are to predicting chemical bonds in a molecule. And that's pretty useful. So I'm going to share the fun and let you have some fun. And why don't you do chlorine? And I'll show you a periodic table real quick. Remember, Lewis structure shows valence electrons. And ready, set, go. By the way, if you haven't figured out, and we did it just a little while ago, chlorine has seven valence electrons. Oh, it warms my heart to see everybody doing Lewis structures. Thank you.
but you never realized chemistry could be so much fun. And it is. If I say it enough times, you'll start believing me. All right, give me a thumbs up when you're done or give me that look like, come on, get to work. All right, I think everybody's done. Let's take a look at this. Chlorine, chemical symbol, CL. How many valence electrons? Seven valence electrons. And therefore you double up. First four, I got three more to go. And there are four possible answers on three sides, you should have two dots, and on one side, you should have one dot. Therefore, another one would be this. And there are two more you could write. And Dr. White has a piece of paper in my house signed by the Board of Regents of Michigan State University saying, I know this stuff, otherwise known as my PhD degree in chemistry. Oh, let's do one more. And why don't we do argon? And let me pull up the periodic table, draw the Lewis structure for argon. I'll give you about seven and a half seconds more before I tell you how many valence electrons argon, ha argon has. Six point eight, six point nine, six point nine five. Times up. Uh, argon chemical symbol AR has eight valence electrons. All right, I think everybody's done. So let's do it. Or wait, I shouldn't rush. Anybody need more time? Nope, I was right, everybody's done. All right, draw the Lewis structure for argon. Here's the chemical symbol. How many valence electrons? Eight valence electrons. Therefore, I'll go one, two, three, four, and then I have four more to go, five, six, seven, eight. And for the Lewis structure for argon, you have each side two dots and that's it. And remember, you never double up before each side has one dot and each side never has more than one dot. Oh, Dr. White just thought of a funny what if I take today's recording and play it for tomorrow's lab? Nah, that's not nice. <laughs> but that was, talk about being lazy. <laughs> anyways, instant summer rerun before the summer. All right. That's a quick uh, practice of stuff we've done that you should know how to do. Since we you just took the test, that's why I didn't assign a problem set for a day, because that wouldn't have been fair. And if I were a student, I wouldn't like it. And therefore, I never do to my students what I wouldn't like, which is my golden rule of teaching. Now, this semester, I didn't have time to squeeze something in, but now I do. So without further ado, I'm going to show you a nice YouTube before we do the lab. And this is just dealing with alkali metals. All right, before I go full screen, 
Does everybody see YouTube on their screen? Do you? Does your dog see it too? <laughs> All right. Enjoy. Let me go full screen on this. Whether you've left school or you're still at school, you can appreciate the sheer fun and mayhem that chemistry can be. There's so much to it. Bunsen and burns, mixing chemicals. Very nice. Now, you may have been allowed to mix very small amounts of lithium with water. You may, if with a responsible adult, have mixed H2O with sodium. And you may, under very strict scientific control, have witnessed potassium mixed with water. If you have, it will only ever have been on one of those rubbish science videos. There you go, mate. Perfect. These next two are the dog's nuts of the periodic table. They are, if you like, the king and queen of alkali metals. Mix these babies with water, stand well back, and watch the mayhem. And that's just what we're going to do. Mr. Tickle, bring on the rubidium. Here it is. Is that it? Well, it might not look like much, Richard, but it's a highly reactive metal. It's sealed in this glass tube under argon atmosphere conditions, just for safety. Right, so what's going to happen when you drop that in the water? Well, imagine, if you will, letting off a hand grenade in a bathtub. Right, up, I'm off. Have that. Okay, Tickle, drop the rubidium in the water. Uh, two grams of rubidium will only react when a specially designed vial dissolves in the water, which gives John a few crucial seconds to get into our safety zone. More like it. only on brain do you get that kind of science. But I believe we can go one better. There's one more alkali metal we can legally use. Yes, Richard, cesium, the emperor of alkali metals, particularly nasty to go up at any time. And that's it. Oh, yes. Yeah, I like it already. Now, what's that going to do when it hits the water? Imagine a depth charge in the bathtub. Round of plate on these two. Thank you. Okay, Tom, go for it. As our cesium sinks in the water, the rapid generation of hydrogen gas should produce quite an explosion. And it does. Magnificent. And I think that concludes today's experiment. There is, I should say, one more, even more reactive metal, frankly. But for some reason, they wouldn't let us help. Any of that. So, there you go. Today's lesson never mixed alkali metals with water. I hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, that's a bunch of those YouTubes from a television show in England called The Brainiacs. I'll show you one more later in the semester. Unfortunately, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Mythbusters TV show? They busted that. Those explosions in the bathtub, they used a lot more than what they claimed. If you use a lot more of the alkali metal, you'll get those type of explosions, but they, I think, threw some dynamite in there to help it do look more effective for the small amount. Now, years ago, some guys at this one high school borrowed about a couple of pounds of sodium and went to Lake Michigan by Northwestern, a beach in Evanston, about six in the morning, Saturday morning, and uh, I think it was May, it was warm out, and took big hunks of sodium and shot him into Lake Michigan. And you saw the same type of explosion because there was a lot of sodium. And then 
it's about 6, 6.30 in the morning. This is way before 9-11. And a policeman came up and said, boys, what are you doing? And somebody very uh, ingenious and a good problem solver said, officer, we're investigating alkali metal reactions with Lake Michigan water. Oh, okay, be careful. And he left. Anyways, you didn't hear that from Dr. White. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. But alkali metals are very dangerous in real life. Uh, uh, sodium isn't that bad, but I've worked with potassium. And if it's at all humid out and you're not doing it in an inert atmosphere, you have an instant fire that water will only make it worse. Think about that. And uh, certain chemicals in uh, chemistry or elements and other chemicals separate people who should be chemists from people who are not going to be chemists. Because uh, uh, how should I say the stress level goes whoop, and you got to learn how to bring it down here and be safe and not kill yourself, which good news I never did. All right, it's time for lab. And today's lab is an exciting lab, part of it and beyond lab Z. Everybody's detecting signs of a chemical change lab. Do you see that? This is available for you to download in the assignment area Blackboard. And the question is, when you mix two chemicals or substances together, do you get a chemical reaction? Well, how do you know? Well, one way, especially in inorganic chemistry, which is what we mainly do in this class, is you see something. And what are signs that will tell you a chemical change has occurred? One, if you see a major color change, and that doesn't mean it just goes from dark blue to light blue. It goes from blue to red or blue to yellow, blue to green. That's a major color change. Another thing is if you see gas form, and you're familiar with seeing gas form as seeing bubbles. So if you see bubbles in something, you've had, when you mix two things together, you've had a chemical change. You've made something new. Now, another one is when you see a precipitate form. Now, precipitate is when you see a new solid form. How many of you are familiar with the paperweights? My sisters had them. I don't have one. Uh, I have other things, but not like that, where you have the uh, globe with the snowman in there. And you know, when you shake it up, you see the little particles of snow coming down. Well, a chemist like me would say, oh, look at the precipitate in that globe. And that's what we be by a precipitate, when you form a new solid. And the last sign or indication that a chemical change has occurred is when there's a temperature change. When you mix two things together, if it gets hotter or if it gets colder, the temperature change, that means you have a chemical change. So once again, there are four signs of a chemical change. Oh, by the way, just a reminder, good news, Anything we do in lab, I'll never put on a test in the lecture. Anything on a lecture test, I'll talk about in the lecture. All right, so what are those four changes? Major color change, gas form, uh, precipitate, which is a solid form. And when you do a mixture or a major temperature change, it gets hot or it gets cold. In today's lab, you will determine if a chemical reaction, also known as a chemical change, occurs when you mix two substances together. And if we did this in COD, it would be a lot of fun because you get to mix things together. Dr. White gets to watch you all have a good time, but and it's a quick lab too. Now, Beyond Lab Z has some good stuff, but they're missing stuff in their lab that I could find. So I found a few others. So there are two procedures for mixture one through five. 
view the YouTube video for that mixture, see the note listed for the location, record your observation in table one. So let's go down to table one. The first one is mixing vinegar with baking powder. Now, if you don't have safety goggles, don't try this at home, at least legally I'm supposed to say that. And some of you have seen the following video. If we go down to the notes, table one notes, you'll see this video. Oh, let's do it, what the heck. Let's have some fun. All right, everybody see YouTube on your screen? Thank you. All right, let's have some fun. And you're supposed to observe this reaction. Is this a chemical reaction or not? I'd be careful of the food color at home. Baking powder plus vinegar. Oh, look what we have. Notice right here, carbon dioxide gas. bubbles it did whoever said that thank you and now you can go up to table one mixture one observation form bubbles or gas and you do the same for two three four and five and those are all found in these YouTube videos. Now, the next procedure, you'll do the experiments in lab beyond lab Z, which I'm gonna teach you right now. For mixture six through 14, you will use beyond lab Z. I happen to put it in there, don't forget to log in, click on chemistry for higher education, then you'll click on it in organic, I'm going to go through this real time, but I decided to read the procedure. Now, what you'll do, and you can come back and look at this when you do the lab, you'll put a test tube in the ring stand holder. I'll show you how to do that in a little while. For the first chemical, you'll look in the upper right corner of your screen and click on that. That's part three. And that puts that into there for part number two. For the second, and let's go back up here, let's go back down here. This is the second substance. So like number six, you'll find it silver plus. And then the lower left, uh, right hand, you'll see reagent bottles. HNO3 is called nitric acid. You'll click on that. They mix together and then you make your observation. and observe the test tube place. Now, when you're done, place the test tube in the red container at the lower right of your screen. Be sure to position the bottom of the test tube over the white circle on the top of the red container. Then you repeat steps one through five for the other mixtures, which are six through 14. All right. Everybody see Beyond Lab Z on your screen? All right. 
When you're in chemistry, make sure the higher ed is highlighted and click on open. And now does everybody see welcome to virtual chem lab on your screen? See up here where it says inorganic, you click on that. And now let me just check something. It should be. Does everybody see the inorganic lab or in the upper corner it says pH key and all that? All right, let me minimize this. Now, watch closely. This is really a lot of fun. They did a good job. This box actually looks like the box test tubes come in when you buy it. It said COD and ECC. Take your cursor, click on this, left mouse click and put it in there. When you do, this is what the test tube looks like. Notice how this all lit up. And now you can choose from that. Can everybody see this all right? Now, I want silver, and this is actually silver chloride, and I'll click on this, and notice this test tube has got silver ions in it. Now, let's do sodium chloride. Everybody see the lower right, these little reagent bottles, NaCl, please pass the knuckle. And now watch closely. I'm gonna click on this, left mouse click with the cursor, which is now an eyedropper over that. Oh, look what happened in here. I've got white something. Now, here's a centrifuge and it took me a while to figure it out. You click on it, it will centrifuge your test tube. Let's do that. And notice you've got a white solid at the bottom. I tried putting it in there and you don't have to, you just have to click on that. Uh, a centrifuge, if you're not familiar, turns real quick and it forces any solid to the bottom. Uh, in case you don't know, your washing machine is a centrifuge. When it goes to spin, it's really a centrifuge getting all the water out of your clothes, which is a good thing. And therefore, we're done with this experiment. If you take silver chloride, uh, silver, I don't think it's silver chloride, silver whatever, I forgot which one, and react it with sodium chloride, guess what? You get a precipitate. Do you get a chemical reaction? You do, because whatever you see a precipitate, you do. Now, when you're done, put your cursor over the, on the test tube. You can pick it up, move it over here. And then if you don't align it properly, and Dr. White has to move my tablet. And when you see where it says clear lab, it's lined. Let, pick up your mouse and it's gone. And now you're ready for the next one. You put that in there and you do that. And that's today's lab. And what you'll do, is do that for each of six through, I already did number seven for you, and everybody should get that right, precipitate number seven. And you do that for six through 14. Now, when you're done with all that, there are some questions you have to answer. Which mixture mixtures had a chemical change occur? Not all of them do, Dr. White sneaky. Now, when you answer it, don't write AG plus sodium chloride. Just use the mixture numbers for your answers, like 1, 7, 35. Oh, they're not 35, but you get the picture. And number two, which mixtures had a gas form? And how do you know that? And again, use the mixture numbers. And then which mixture or mixtures, when I do this, that means there can be one or there could be many. Had a temperature change, and how do you know this? Please use numbers for that. Which ones had no chemical change, and how do you know? Notice I put the most hated words in a question, how do you know that, or please explain. 
And number five and six, I'll let you read on your own, number six. And that's that. And that's today's lab. Now, if you'd like, since you have a license, if you want to play with other ones that aren't on my list, have fun. It's a lot of fun. Now, I didn't use the nose in there, which tells you if you smell certain things. I've talked to them about expanding that. But anyways, I'm done for today. A uh, couple important uh, announcements or just, uh, yeah, I guess announcements before I let you go. One, sometime late, by today, you should have uploaded test number one. Uh, since I don't use all multiple choice, it's going to take me a couple hours to grade it. And I'm teaching tomorrow and I have other responsibilities today. I guarantee by Sunday, 1 p.m., your grades will be in Blackboard for you to see for test number one. However, check on Saturday. Usually, if things go well, I should hopefully get it done sometime Saturday, either morning or afternoon. Are there any good soccer games Saturday morning? But anyways, I'll get that done. Also, by some before Monday morning, but hopefully sometime Sunday or maybe even Saturday afternoon or evening, I will send out individually, each of you will get an email that will have like for problem 1A, how many points you got, 1B, 2C, whatever they are, and you'll get that. On Monday, I will go through the whole test in lecture, but I will remove those test answers from the video because I don't want those floating around the internet for the rest of the time. If you can't make it on Monday, always feel free to come to my office hours on Monday and Wednesday night. And I'll be more than happy to open up the test key and go through the test answers with you because there's no such thing as a dumb question in my universe. And I understand life happens and you may not be able to make it sometimes. Who knows? I hope you can. Now with that, I'm gonna do a goodbye like I do in the rest I'm going to tell my, for those who want to stick around, my Mardi Gras story. All right. So with that, I'm going to say, gang gazun, be healthy, stay warm, and I'll see you on Monday. For those of you who want to stick around, let me do an official gang gazun. Gang gazun, goodbye. I'll see you on Monday. Bye.